For those of you who are now entering the webinar, I'm just going to wait a few seconds um, to let people join in, and then we will start with the introductions. Okay, well, why don't we get started now? Um, so my name is Toba Wang. I am a senior democracy fellow at the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I wanna start with just a few announcement, uh, announcements on the Ash Center's uh, behalf. The Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Um, we'd like to thank and acknowledge our co-sponsor for today's talk. It's the Rappaport Institute. Um, for Greater Boston at the Harvard Kennedy School. And just to let you know, the event is being recorded. Um, the video will be publicly available on YouTube. Um, and also, as per usual, you're welcome to submit your questions at any time during the event in the Q&A um, section. And if you have other things that you wanna comment on and so on, you're, you're welcome to do that in the chat. Um, and, uh, I think that's that's it for all the announcements. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Beth Wong. Um, Beth is the director of the Massachusetts Voter Table, a statewide coalition of community organizations that advances civic access and engagement. And I, I know that they do it very well. So take it away, Beth. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tova. And I'm so glad to join all of you uh, on this important topic of non-citizen voting. It is a critical way that we will build a multiracial democracy. Uh, we are going to first hear from Professor Alex Kesar, uh, who is the author of The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, and a professor of history and social policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, and then we have an all-star panel uh, of uh, of Annette Wong, who is the uh, Director of Programs at Chinese uh, for Affirmative Action at, in San Francisco, which won non-citizen voting in 2016. Uh, Counselor Tiffany Caban from New York City, who, uh, who spearheaded efforts to win non-citizen voting uh, in December of 2021. Uh, and uh, Counselor uh, Kendra Lara from Boston, who is spearheading efforts to win non-citizen voting here. Uh, and so first we'll hear um, a short talk from Professor Kesar uh, about non-citizen voting, and then we'll jump into a panel. So without further ado, uh, Alex, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Beth, and thanks to whoever is responsible for inviting me to, to, uh, to, jo to join this discussion. And as I've become accustomed to over the years, sort of, I do the history first in five minutes. I, I, do, I will do 200 years in five minutes, and then, and then we will turn to the present. Um, the, look, the headline here is that one of the most common objections to non-citizen voting at present is that, is that this violates tradition, that, that, that the right to vote has always been combined to citizens. Um, and why, you know, why should we do anything uh, different now? Why should we make exceptions now to our long traditions? And the fact is that that's, that, that assertion about the history simply isn't true. Our history is much more complex and there have been periods and places when non-citizen voting was common. And let me just very quickly kind of run through this. In the early years of the Republic, after the constitution is written in the first 10 or 20 years, um, the, uh, it was quite, the distinction between citizen and non-citizen was murky. The right to vote was always a matter of state law and state constitutions, not federal law and federal constitutions. And some state constitutions said that you had to be a citizen to vote. Others said you had to be, just had to be an inhabitant. And the boundary between inhabitant and citizen uh, was, a, was a fuzzy one. Then around 1809, uh, the process of naturalization became more formalized. It was left entirely to the federal government. The, the definition of citizenship was more firmly established. And then there's a period for about 20 years when more and more states uh, restricted voting to citizens and they changed from inhabitant to citizen. Then what's, right, after that, uh, starting towards the middle of the 19th century, the momentum shifted in a development that may surprise uh, many people. And what happened 
was that a number of states uh, began to permit certain categories of non-citizens to vote. They did this in part, and we, we, we have to keep this in mind, this was not just being principled and altruistic. They did this in part because they wanted to attract settlers uh, to their states. Uh, they wanted to increase their population, their tax base. And they thought, and this is an interesting fact, they thought it would be attractive to potential immigrants to know that they, could, they didn't have to wait five years uh, to become citizens. So these laws were called alien intent or declarant alien laws. And basically what they said was that if you had been in the state or the country for two years, and if you declared your intention to become a citizen, um, then you could vote. Um, and these laws were passed. There was a first one in Illinois, but the big wave starts in 1848 in Wisconsin when, when the law is passed after interesting debate in the Wisconsin state, liter, uh, state legislature, which was then more progressive than it is now. Um, and then after Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Indiana, Kansas, Minnesota, Oregon, a number of states uh, joined in as did the federal government in permitting non-citizen voting in, in the territories that it controlled that were not yet states. This was true in the Northwest Territories and then later in Western Territories. After the Civil War, this trend continued um, and it continued in the South and in places in the West and, um, and the Southwest. An, an additional dozen states uh, passed these laws. Notably, none of these laws was passed on the East Coast, nor was any, were any of these laws, nor uh, did California uh, pass such a law. The constitutionality of these laws was questioned and challenged, uh, but on the whole, the verdict was that they were okay. And there was a judgment from the Illinois Supreme Court about them, which I think bears quoting. This is from sometime in the mid to late 1840s. And it says it was perfectly all right for the state to grant, and I'm quoting here, the right of suffrage to those who having by habitation and residence identified their interests and feelings with the citizenry, although they may be neither native nor adopted citizens. I mean, that's the gist of the rationale, the people who were here to stay, people who are part of the community, who identify with the community and have interest in the community should have the right to vote. Uh, more than 20 or 25 states, the exact number is a little murky, uh, had such provisions in their constitutions at some point. But then the wave begins to swing back again at the end of the 19th century. And between the 1890s and the 1920s, all of these laws um, were repealed. This occurred in the context of very large scale waves of immigration and also with some, something else about those waves of those late 19th century and early 20th century immigration uh, waves, which may have changed the way immigration was perceived, which is that in, in, these, in, in the immigration in that period uh, from, from Europe, uh, there was a great deal of return migration. People were coming here and not staying and returning. You know, the, the, the numbers are hard to come by, but they're, 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 but they're very high. I mean, like 50% of Italian immigrants returned to Europe. Um, and, and that changed the image or part of the image of who immigrants were, although it actually varied by place and it varied by uh, place of origin. Uh, the last state to repeal its alien intent laws was Arkansas believe it or not, in the late 1920s. And since that time, um, there have not been alien intent laws of any sort, but as my colleagues I, I suspect, on this panel will, uh, I suspect, indicate, there have been a variety of efforts to implement non-citizen voting, particularly in local elections, um, in different locales around the state. And the precise nature of those um, uh, has varied in part with the structure of the state constitution and what the state what state constitutions allow municipalities uh, to to do on their own. So the 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 arc of the history uh, is complicated, but it's certainly the case that there that that in our past non citizens have been permitted to vote uh, in large numbers and in a great many states for substantial periods of time. And now I'll let the rest of you carry on. 
Well, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, we likely will ask you for some reflections uh, uh, on what our panelists share. So uh, I, I would first love to hear uh, from uh, Annette Wong from the uh, Chinese for Affirmative Action in San Francisco. Uh, how did you pass non-citizen voting in 2016? Uh, what were some of the uh, winning coalitions? Uh, I think the polarization was somewhat similar in 2016, but I feel like all of the uh, narrative about uh, voter fraud and uh, demonization of immigrants. That certainly happened, but it really has ratcheted up a couple of levels since 2016. Um, I'd love to hear how, uh, how you won this important victory uh, in, uh, what, six years ago now? Yes. Hi. Thank you, Beth. Um, and thank you, uh, Professor Kazar, for that great um, <clears throat> history and background. So as Beth mentioned, um, I'm, I'm Annette Wong, I'm the Director of Programs at Chinese for Affirmative Action. And in 2016, um, the same election, <clears throat> pardon me, the same election where um, Trump was voted into office, um, San Francisco passed non-citizen voting. And so we were in a very difficult place in terms of hearing some of the, um, the, the xenophobic language that had been going around at the time because of Trump's campaign trail. And you know how we won is um, a story that doesn't just uh, begin and end in 2016, uh, but actually San Francisco had tried to pass non-citizen voting uh, for many years, even previously. And so um, this was on the ballot before voters in 2004 and in 2010, before it finally passed um, in 2016. And really what made the difference um, that year was that you know, third time's a charm, but it was, a lot of it was about the political window that was created because of, um, Pre, uh, former President Trump being on the ballot and, um, you know, leveraging that political window to our advantage in a city like San Francisco, where we knew that uh, progressive voters would come out to essentially, um, you know, put their stake in the ground against Trump. And so, you know, there were a series of factors. Obviously, um, we, hold, we, we relied on people power and community organizing, uh, and we worked with various stakeholders, uh, including uh, immigrant rights groups, uh, advocates and service providers, uh, voting rights groups, the legal community, uh, education equity groups, because uh, San Francisco's non-citizen voting ordinance uh, is specifically for school board elections, so it's not citywide. Um, we also worked with uh, Democratic clubs, with San Francisco electeds, uh, both former electeds and, and at the time current electeds, and we also worked with the academic community, um, in particular, uh, Professor Ron Hayduck, who has also written extensively on non-citizen voting, and uh, Professor Kathleen Cole at um, University of San Francisco, uh, all participated in the campaign. Um, and uh, before I move any further, I should clarify that San Francisco's ordinance that passed allows uh, non-citizens uh, who are parents or caretakers or guardians of children that qualify for San Francisco Unified School District to vote in school board elections. So it's very specific um, in terms of the type of election that people can vote in, but in terms of what type of immigrant can vote, it's any non-citizen, whether you're undocumented or on a temporary um, you know, status or um, you know, a green card holder. So the spectrum in terms of um, who can vote. Um, and in terms of some of the narrative uh, that and talking points that we were using at the time, you know, with Trump on the ballot, we really uh, were hoping to encourage people by saying, you know, this is a step to take hold of power rather than falling into panic. So power, not panic um, in these moments when we're hearing all of this xenophobic narrative um, coming from the right. Um, we also emphasize the expanding of democracy and access to democracy. Um, at a time when you know, we heard conservative forces are trying to push to limit voting rights. Um, voting for non-citizen voting is taking a stand to expand access to democratic process to everyone. Uh, we also painted this as an equity measure. Um, a third of San Francisco um, families are immigrants. And so you know, a third of the Unified School District um, are immigrant families. And so uh, if they're in the school district but they don't have, their parents don't have the power to vote, they essentially are having decisions made about their children's education without parental input. Um, so again, this kind of idea of no decisions about us without us. Um, and you know, I, I'm so excited to be sharing the space with Council Member 
Caban and, and also um, Council Member Lara, because the role of our local city supervisors was also very key. Um, previously, and even in 2016, uh, a local city supervisor helped to do the polling for our non-citizen voting um, ballot measure and also um, helped to get it onto the ballot uh, in 2016. So there were key roles and um, even former electeds uh, came back to work on um, this initiative, people that had tried to put it on the ballot in 2004 and 2010. Um, so um, the role of city council was incredibly important in our San Francisco win as well. Wow, well, that's really amazing. Thanks so much for sharing the story of how San Francisco uh, won uh, the ordinance using the ballot um, to uh, get non-citizen voting in school committee or we always say school committee in Massachusetts, uh, school board elections. Uh, and so I'd love to hear what the story is behind uh, non-citizen voting, uh, the victory about non-citizen voting in New York City in December uh, 2021, super recent, congratulations. And I'll pass it over to you, uh, Councillor Caban. Yeah, thank you. First of all, it is an absolute pleasure and, and privilege to be sharing space with y'all. Um, and I just wanna say that there are obviously a lot of parallels between um, you know, San Francisco and here. And just to say that I had the privilege of kind of getting to come in at the end and celebrate um, this victory as an elected because I was an advocate supporting non-citizen voting as, you know, an advocate and an organizer, um, but was running my campaign for city council um, and took office about a month early earlier than my other colleagues because the seat that I was running in was, was vacant. My predecessor had resigned. So I came in in December when we knew that like it, we were gonna get this to go to a vote and I got to be the last co-sponsor. It was my very first vote as a city council member, which was very, very cool. Um, but you know, like was just talked about, I mean, the, the origins or the, the life of movements are long. Um, the life of campaigns can be long. Uh, and similarly, in, in our case, it was about a decade long and it, and, and it had everything to do with political windows because it wasn't that it wasn't a popular idea amongst our communities, but the, that the, the circumstances had to be like right and we had to organize to create the kind of political environment we needed to make it happen. And so the campaign itself went through several iterations starting back in um, like 2009, 2010, and really you could track it back to a, a neighborhood in Queens, Jackson Heights, um, which is close to, to where I represent, I'm in Astoria, um, but it is like, it's the, the, the most diverse council district in the most diverse borough in the United States, right? Um, and the council member there at the time, former council member Danny Drum, his district, the people who lived in his district somewhere between 65 to 70% of the people who live in the district could not vote for him uh, because of their, their, their status as, as non-citizens. Um, and so he really kind of championed um, this effort. And then you fast forward a few years later to, to, to 2013 and there was a lot of growing momentum around it. Um, the, the city council finally held a hearing on the legislation, but the mayor was the mayor. The mayor was was Bloomberg at this uh, at the time, right? Like not a, not a friendly mayor to this cause. And then here in New York City, our city council, we have fifty one members. We have a speaker of the body who holds an immense amount of power, right? Like things can't go to a vote unless the speaker says so. Um, and so Christine Quinn was the speaker at the time and was just really aligned with with Mayor Bloomberg at the time. And it it kind of lost momentum. It died a little bit. Um, but the campaign then shifted to an, another organization sort of taking on the lead, NYIC, the New York Im Immigration Coalition. Uh, and from there, they started really building it out. And the coalition really sounds a lot like what, what existed in San Francisco, right? It, it, were, it was all of these you know, immigrant rights and service orgs. Um, there were local elected officials. There were Dem clubs. There were, there were unions that got, in uh, got involved um, and just, you know, beautiful diversity in it that it was like AP, AAPI communities and Latinx folks and, um, you know, every, like running the gamut across the board. Uh, and then from there, you know, they, we got a super majority for the council members to, to sign on, but there were issues with leadership, again, finding the political 
moment window, we saw a lot of really interesting discourse and, and communities being pitted against one another. Um, and they couldn't get it to this was before I came in, they could not get this to the floor for a vote. And so they used every tool in their toolbox. They went to the press. They started leaking the idea that maybe they would do what we call here um, a letter to, to discharge, which is seen as like a, a really hostile act um, in the legislature, right? It's like, well, you won't let this go to a vote. If we get enough members to sign this, we can override that and, and force the vote to happen. Um, and with that info being leaked to reporters and it getting back to like the powers that be, uh, and the coalition continuing to organize and, and to your point, right, like a lot of the grassroots organizing and empowering community members, it just created this environment where like it, it, it was going to happen. This is our time. This is our moment. So it did go to the floor for a vote. But I would like to share a little bit of my experience, even that day that that we voted on it, because as a completely green legislator, right, had, had never been a part of this process before. Um, I'm looking at the list of co-sponsors, feeling really good and confident that we're going to vote on this thing. It's going to pass. No big deal. And we ended up in several hours of debate on this bill that had us the super majority of co-sponsors. And it like completely blew my mind. You had people who had, you know, signed on um, as sponsors. And then all of a sudden they were on the floor speaking against the bill, which is not a normal thing at all. Um, but it really also did encapsulate some of the, the challenges that the, the campaign faced over you know, the decade long span. We had a former council member, Lori Cumbo, um, you know, give this speech around how um, extending the right to vote to non-citizens would dilute the power of the black vote, um, which was just, I mean, just devastating to have someone to, to hear someone say on on so many different levels, right? One, because obviously um, there there are black immigrants, <laughs> and that, like that is a thing. Um, but but also this idea that you know expanding the right to vote for some or or empowering some communities would then disempower or dilute the power of of others. Um, just these really divisive strategies that play into the hands of, of the systems as they ex exist, right? Like these racialized capitalist systems uh, that want us to be breaking, breaking away and, and fracturing um, on these fronts. And so there was a really, really robust uh, debate on, on that. And ultimately, you know, ultimately it passed and really, really proud that it did. Uh, but like now we're having all of these conversations and, and I know that this is part of, of the program that we'll get into is like, Okay, what's next? How do we make sure um, that this that this is successful going forward? Oh, and if I could point out one thing about two about what we won specifically, it's a little bit broader um, in in a lot of respects than San Francisco, but then a little bit narrower in in a specific. So basically, the floor is anyone with work authorization. So it is um, you know you can be a green card holder, work author, like essentially people who are known to the, the government, um, you know, undocumented, entirely undocumented folks, um, you know, folks without papers can't, but if you are eligible, you can vote in any municipal election. And that means our city council members, our mayor, our borough president. So it is, it's a large swath of, of very powerful positions. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that powerful story. I mean, there's that, uh, that I'm probably going to butcher this Antonio Gramsci quote, right? It's uh, the the old world is dying, the new world is is begging to be born. Now is the time of monsters. Like that was a time of like, oh god, this racial animosity between uh, people of color. Well, uh, we do have an amazing history of a uh, of a rainbow coalition um, in Boston, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, the very diverse city council in Boston, which is now majority BIPOC. Um, and we now have a person of color who is mayor, who, uh, uh, which uh, that all came from 40 years of organizing. Um, I think, you know, I, I love that your first vote, uh, uh, Councillor Caban was on, uh, was on non-citizen voting. I love that, uh, Councillor Lara, your, your maiden, I think you did your maiden speech first in Spanish, which I think was incredible. Uh, so now that we've heard a bit about how 
uh, the cities of how uh, non-citizen voting uh, came to San Francisco and is coming to New York City. Uh, big question to you, Councillor Lara, um, how, uh, what is our plan to win non-citizen voting here in Boston? Not a loaded question at all, Beth. I'm, you might hear this in the background. <laughs> it's school vacation here in Boston and I have a five-year-old. Uh, so I, although I'm very excited to be here, I'm wrangling um, a, a toddler who thinks he's a teen at the moment. Uh, thank you so much for having me here, Annette, Councillor Kavan. I'm just incredible um, to be with this kind of rock star panel. Uh, I am excited to be having this conversation around non-citizen voting. One, because it's very personal to me, but like Beth alluded, there has been just decades long work happening here in the city of Boston that I'm kind of just a continuation of. Uh, it's also similarly, I'm a brand new counselor. I've only got inaugurated in January. And so to have this be my first action on the council and to be the person who is stewarding this um, forward along with, you know, all of my council colleagues who signed on to be um, sponsors feels like a big undertaking, it feels massive. Um, I was not the first to file this in here in the city of Boston. Like Beth said, we have a rainbow coalition. And so in 2007, we had um, Felix uh, Di Arroyo, who was the first Latino on the Boston City Council, uh, Chuck Turner, who was the first black socialist elected to the Boston City Council, Sam Yoon, who was the first Asian American <laughs> elected official ever in Boston. And uh, and I, I think also Councillor Ross filed a home rule petition in 2007 uh, to the City Council uh, for non uh, citizen voting to ultimately give the right to vote um, to immigrants that had legal status specifically here in the city of Boston. That home rule petition in 2007 um, failed to pass the city council with a vote of six to seven, just one singular <laughs> vote. So even in 2007, we were incredibly close and there was a commitment and an energy to get this done here in the city of Boston. So since then, it hasn't been filed. Uh, I, I, there was um, Councillor Andrea Campbell, who later ran for mayor, held a hearing on um, um, voting rights for people with legal status, uh, but did not move forward, didn't take any action, whether they're a home rule petition or an ordinance. And so that home rule petition in 2007 is the only time that something has been filed um, with the Boston City Council, and then we've had one other hearing. And so we, heard a lot of different things from people, a lot of the same things, a lot of the same rhetoric that you heard in New York, a lot of the same rhetoric that you hear in San Francisco. As soon as I gave my maiden speech, I got an email and a Twitter message from two different people who said the same thing. If we give immigrants the right to vote, then we're diluting the black vote. And I had the same reaction. I was, I couldn't believe it. Um, like you were saying you were like oh yeah there are black immigrants and i'm sitting here and i'm like i'm i'm black for i'm a black first generation right i'm just like what about my people um so we are kind of aware about what, what we're up against ultimately like we know that there's going to have to be a lot of work that's going to happen in community there's going to have to be a lot of coalition building here in boston to make this happen so we, you know, this, my mate, I gave, like Beth mentioned, I gave my maiden speech on expanding the electorate and deepening democracy. So this idea of giving the municipal right to vote to people with legal status here in the city of Boston comes, you know, as a part of a larger vision to deepen the democratic process by enfranchising immigrants, by lowering the voting age, by making sure that there's a ballot box in every jail. And I think that this expansion of what we consider the electorate is coming on the heels of, you know, this progressive tide here in the city of Boston. It's coming on the heels of a majority BIPOC city council. It's coming on the heels of the mayor. There is all, we've just almost 70, over 70% 70 of voters in Boston voted to transition to an elected school committee versus an appointed school committee, which we've had. And so 
there is a yearning and there is an energy for more democracy, for deepening um, voter rights in the city of Boston. And I think that it's a natural reaction to what we're seeing happening in the country, right? We're seeing so many places move in the other direction that naturally our people are like, oh no, we have to dig our feet in. We have to in, like strengthen protections. We have to give more power. We have to give more voice if we wanna make sure that we don't end up in the places um, that we're seeing and end up in the same place kind of like everything that we're seeing across the country. So there was an incredible amount of support for making this happen. Uh, where we are right now in the process and in terms of how we're gonna win this is gonna be a lot of coalition building. Right now, there is a massive coalition in Boston and all across the state of Massachusetts that's working on getting driver's licenses for people who are undocumented. And that movement has gained so much traction. Similarly, right, 30, 30 plus years of organizing, so much work has gone into it and Already, people have been trying to use the fact that I have filed for, you know, non-citizen voting to kind of say, see, if we do the licenses, then we're going to want to vote. And then, oh, my, the immigrants are going to, so much power. How can we give them more voice than what we've already been giving them? Uh, and so we are in a lot of strategic conversations with the coalition because ultimately we're all going to be working on this together about the timing and when this happens and how far along do we wait for what's happening at the state house to move before we move what's happening on the city council and one of the big questions that we have in our office and that has been really exciting for me to explore and be in conversations with people about is whether or not we need a home rule petition and whether or not we should do it through home rule petition instead of doing it by ordinance here in Boston. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, so bear with me to, if there are people listening who are Boston politics, like, what do you mean? How could you do that? Well, the hearing order that I put forth is to restore municipal voting rights to people with legal status, because we have already had this before. And so what's happening is that what I believe and what I have floated to other lawyers who are kind of looking into this a little bit is that there is a precedent that's already been set because our constitution and the language of our constitution has not changed from when we had you know non-citizen voting to when we do now and so one could make the argument that citizen in the language does not mean someone who is a legal citizen of the united states but actually means anybody who lives in the commonwealth uh because the language was the same similar so we're playing with some fire obviously <laughs> we're like trying to figure out if that's the best way i don't know that that's going to be the best way to do it we might end up with the home rule petition in which case we're definitely going to want to uh collaborate with a lot with the coalition and make sure that the timing is correct uh but i think that as an for me as an organizer the most important thing is to have the conversation to start um from the bottom up right this is and this was a part of my maiden speech is that democracy doesn't come from the top it comes from the bottom right and so if we're going to build a government from the bottom then we build that momentum from the bottom we build the momentum from the grassroots we go furthest out into the margins and move our way inward instead of having the city council kind of pass it um, from the inside out. And so we have a big organizing strategy. We are gonna have meetings with all of the folks who are a part of the license coalition. We're talking to unions and we are going to build this external momentum. I believe that we have the votes on the city council. They, you know, there's there's very little, there's some pushback. There are some concerns that people have. Um, some of the concerns that advocates had were particularly around whether or not people could accidentally vote in a federal election, which then would bar them from becoming citizens altogether. So there's the conversation around whether or not giving people with legal status would stop them from becoming citizens because, you know, people become citizens only to vote, not to not live under the constant threat of deportation. <laughs> So, you know, they're like, oh, what's going to make people become citizens? And I'm just like, what do you mean? <laughs> um, wanting to stay here. And so that is one. The other one is whether or not people could accidentally vote in federal elections, then barring them from becoming citizens. And so we have been 
starting to have conversations with our elections department about what implementation would look like, a separate voter roll, right? Kind of like separate ballots that don't include the federal, you know, to kind of like, so we're trying to like listen to the concerns that we've already heard with some of the work that has been done before I got on the city council and really try to create a home rule petition and a process that feels good and that I know my colleagues will be more than happy to support. But like Beth said, you know, we have majority BIPOC um, city councilors. I think that there are questions that people have about implementation that I think we can answer through the process. But I believe that we have the votes to move it to the state house. Um, and we just need to make sure that we get organized there and that we can move it through the state house, however long it takes. But this is, you know, hard work. It's work that's going to take a really long time. I'm dedicated to it, whether I'm on the city council or whether I'm not on the city council. I think this is something that we need to do for our people. And I'm really excited about uh, the possibility that this is going to open up for Boston with the elected school committee, with non-citizen voting, with we, we, there's already a home rule petition drafted for lowering the voting age uh, and allowing 16 to 17 year olds to vote, which is being sponsored by some of my other colleagues. And so we are getting to work on expanding the electorate. We are getting to work to make sure that if government is gonna be representative, particularly local government is gonna be representative, then that means that everybody has to have a voice. And the way that you make sure that everybody has a voice is that you enfranchise the people who are most directly impacted by the decisions that we're making at City Hall. So we're excited to make it happen. I will definitely be reaching out to Annette. I will be reaching out to Councilor Caban. I wanna you know, hear all about the process, the best practices. I'm getting ready for the lawsuit. <laughs> Right, like we're just kind of like I, I, I want to learn, and I'm learning so much already, hearing from you now, and hearing some of the historical context, um, as well, uh, and yeah, you know, happy to to work together and collaborate to make sure that we make this happen. Awesome. So I think with a few questions around implementation, I feel like we don't have like a better person uh, to ask other than Annette um, about uh, what are some of the complications and barriers. Uh, what's uh, how have you organized parents to uh, and really all types of uh, immigrants to vote in school board elections. What has the implementation looked like in the past couple of years? Yes, thank you for the question, Beth. And actually, Council Member Lara um, highlighted a lot of the um, you know, similar kinds of challenges and barriers that we've also experienced. So, um, you know, and I, I can address, I think in San Francisco, we have come up against these barriers and we've done our best to address them, but we're always looking to learn from other um, areas and municipalities to see how we can um, glean from other um, municipalities' best practices as well. So we would love to continue learning alongside you. Um, in terms of challenges and barriers, you know, I think that <clears throat> one of the first initial barriers that is not so much anymore, but um, as I mentioned earlier, our version of non-citizen voting began when Trump came into office. And so actually a lot of the same folks that supported non-citizen voting when it was on the ballot, when it came time to draft the ordinance that would um, put this measure into the charter, a lot of those same allies, um, city um, supervisors, <clears throat> immigrant rights advocates, then became very fearful. And they were like, we shouldn't push forward. We shouldn't, um, we shouldn't implement this essentially. Um, and I think from CAA's perspective and a lot of our um, folks who have been a part of the Immigrant Parent Voting Collaborative here felt that, you know, with every newly enfranchised group, it has never been safe to vote. Uh, but that doesn't mean we should take the right away. It means that we need to do what we can to safeguard it. And so our approach to ensuring, you know, those safeguards are that, you know, everyone that is considering registering and voting as a non-citizen should get an immigration consult. Um, and we have provided uh, you know, on ramps to for folks to be able to access uh, information about community based legal service providers, uh, including working with the Department of Elections to um, do outreach on uh, those services as well as a part of their outreach on non citizen voting. Um, additionally, you know, I think in our approach to outreach, we're not saying yes, it's a good idea for every non citizen to vote, uh, please do so. Instead, it's, you know, um, this is one way that a parent can be involved in their child's education. But if you don't feel comfortable, you need to assess your own situation and um, go from there. And if you feel comfortable voting, here's how you would register and do that. If you don't, here are other ways to get involved. Attend school board meetings, attend this you know, San Francisco Unified School District Forum and, get, and raise your voice there, raise your concerns there. Um, so those are, those are a couple of the responses that we've had. Um, I think one of the largest concerns around the Trump administration was the safety and security of personal information and data. You know, can the federal government, law enforcement, including ICE, 
or even private individuals get access to non-citizen registrants' personal information? Um, can it be subject to subpoena? So this was another challenge and barrier that we faced <clears throat> in our outreach for non-citizen voting. A lot of folks asked this question. And I think for us, there are a couple kind of uh, responses. I think uh, the first level is that uh, San Francisco is a sanctuary city. Um, and as I believe, you know, um, your cities are as well, which means no city resources will go towards aiding in federal immigration investigations. Uh, but, you know, the sanctuary ordinance also has its limitations. And so what we did was that in the ordinance that followed the ballot measure, we, um, we worked with a, a local supervisor to ensure that that ordinance addressed some of these concerns as much as we could legislate um, you know, safe, safeguards and processes that would help safeguard personal information. And so one thing we did was that on the registration form, um, we ensured through the ordinance that there would be a notice to let potential registrants know that their information could be obtained by federal authorities, that we couldn't provide 100% protection around that. Um, we encouraged people to consult an immigration attorney and gave a website where people could go to look those, um, look those places up. Uh, and we ensured that this kind of notice appeared on registration forms, it appeared on mailer information, it appears on the Department of Elections website. And that notice was also made available in 48 different languages that the school district uses. Um, and those were identified by the school district. And, and, you know, we received some pushback about this notice because people were like, well, this is just going to scare people away. This could be seen as a voter suppression tactic. Uh, but from our vantage point, um, our goal there was to say, well, people need to make an informed decision. And in order to do so, they need to have all of the facts and information. And for some folks, they will feel that it's worth it, even if there is the potential risk of having their personal data found out. Um, so that was another kind of barrier that we encountered. And um, a third barrier is one that uh, Councilman Lara already um, articulated around the impact on immigration processes. Will registering to vote have an adverse impact on a naturalization application on someone's adjustment of status? Could it even lead to deportation? And also as a part of the passage of that ordinance, uh, we, included, um, we included a mandate for the Department of Elections to provide right to vote letters. So for every non-citizen registrant that registers and votes, they can go to the Department of Elections and request uh, a formal letter that will uh, outline um, people, it will personalize the person's name, it will state the ordinance that allows them to vote, and it will be signed by the Director of uh, Department of Elections, and people can submit this as an affidavit with their immigration applications. And that's not completely foolproof, and so we're also working because we have heard folks having issues during naturalization. Um, and what what helps, what tends to help is, you know, having an immigration attorney, uh, but not everybody has access to that. So the other thing that we've done is we're uh, working with the Immigrant Legal Resource Center to try to talk to our local USCIS office um, to help the adjudicators get trained on non-citizen voting, that it is lawful voting. Um, so, so those are a couple of things that we've done to address that. And um, to, to kind of wrap up the section around um, challenges, I think the, the additional couple of learnings that we've had uh, is that something that would be super critical in implementation is really the importance of citywide investments. So really funding for the implementation of the ordinance, not just passing the ordinance itself, but having funds for the Department of Elections, funds for a local civic engagement office to be able to implement. Um, the other thing is partnerships across governmental agencies, uh, including the local school district. Well, for us, local school district, because we're school board elections only. Um, the third piece was around language access and including and ensuring that there is inclusive language access um, in all of the outreach materials that goes out from the Department of Elections um, and, and materials around the, the voting rights. But of course, this all again goes back to this takes funding, resources and, and budgetary allocations. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll note is that, you know, this re we really try to frame this as a broad effort. Um, so not just about voting, although that's very important, but more broadly about civic engagement. How do, we, how do we provide on-ramps for limited English proficient immigrants who are otherwise um, you know, completely marginalized uh, and left out of decision-making spaces? How do we create those on-ramps and voting as one, but what are the other ways? Um, so you, know, you see um, you know, various initiatives that pop up that are things like uh, non-citizens on commissions and boards, um, but you know, those are quite high level. So I think we're also thinking about, you know, easier on ramps like participation in different spaces that are um, that allow place allow folks to give feedback to uh, governmental policies and, and practices. So I'll wrap up there. 
Oh, wow. I think I was taking a lot of notes about how, how it, uh, this works in San Francisco. Uh, I saw both counselors look down a few times and I'm sure that you took a few notes also. Um, that was super excellent. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to pass it uh, back to Tova uh, to moderate a little bit of, of Q&A. Yeah, I'm going to Q&A from the audience and there were a lot of questions and even a lot of questions that were submitted before the event. So I'm going to try and glue some of them together a little bit. Um, there were a few that were really um, kind of pushing back on this concept and asking um, if non-citizens can vote, what's the point of being a citizen and, and won't this mean, what, what would be the reason for anyone to become a citizen if they're allowed to vote now? Um, and that kind of kind of pushed back on it, which I'm I'm guessing you guys have heard before and what your response to that is. Um, I don't know who we want to start with, uh, Councillor Caban. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we all could probably hit so many different pieces on this front. And so maybe I will just touch on one, but um, I also just never look, I try to never look at anything, um, you know, without having a, a global lens and looking beyond what just is happening in our municipality, because the fact of the matter is, is that U.S. trade, intelligence, military, like all of these policies create the conditions that impoverish people, that cause devastation, that destabilize other, other countries, other places, and drive migration, drive immigration. And so like, what, do, what, what duties do we have as people who cause that um, and, and not just, you know, having people come here, but welcoming them and making sure that there are, are significant paths to, to dignified livelihoods. Uh, and, you know, to the point that was made earlier about, um, you know, the goal, not just being to have the status of citizen, but really like at the end of the day, can we agree on working together towards building an equitable society that doesn't leave people behind, right? That, that honors, um, you know, the dignity and the, and the shared needs of, of all people because we have these systems that exploit, oppress, marginalize specific groups of people for very specific reasons. And this again goes back to even, you know, that, that sort of forced tension between certain communities when really, again, taking that larger context, understanding that these systems don't serve you, they don't serve you. And at our, like, while, while we can acknowledge very different cultural experiences um, and all of, all of these different things, but that like, we can get to a common place of saying, well, the, the, the root of, you know, our, you know, why our people get exploited and marginalized. They're, they're, they come from the same exact place, right? And I go back to oftentimes like racialized capitalism and all those different things. But I don't know, that's, that's my beginnings of a response. I feel like I can ramble on about a lot of different things, but also want to create space for these brilliant folks to, to weigh in. Uh, and so how are you responding to that? Um, so uh, yes, this came up, and we had the you know we had the same conversation uh, with one of my council colleagues. That was you know, and and so there's the specifics, which for Boston particularly, and so to me, when I think about strategy and I think about communication, I think about the answer that I give to the different answers that I give to different people, the different answers that I give to different people that will matter to them and will move them to be supportive of this. And so the answer that I give my people is not the same answer that I give people who are maybe more conservative or people who are right. Like th there's, there's, a, an, there's a, an array of answers to give strategically as like an organizing strategy to move people who maybe are not on your side to move in that direction. So I will, that is my caveat is that I have many different responses based on who I'm speaking to. Um, similar to Councillor Caban, I you know, look, look at this with a more expansive lens. I am your friendly socialist city council city council member here in Boston, and I enter this conversation with the the all, all of my personal like socialist underpinnings that you cannot actually have any kind of representative government if there are people in in your society that do not have a voice that cannot that have no entry point into the civic process. You can't actually have a democratic 
uh, governance. And so anybody who is in any way, shape or form interested in maintaining democracy, who believes in, you know, the impact that we can have in our local government, who believes in the US government and our structure, or who at least believes in the ideals in the way that that they were created and that they were meant to function to give you know to build a government from the bottom that our government should be of the people and for the people you can't have a government of the people and if some of the people do not have the right to participate ultimately and so boston is the home of the beginning of everything for better or for worse and so the conversation here has ultimately been very anchored in the constitution and the patriotism <laughs> that a lot of our people here feel um that kind of I, that i think is a lot of what drives this question around like oh well what's going to make people become you know how are we going to get people to become citizens uh and i again this issue is very personal for me so excuse me if i'm maybe getting too personal um in terms of how i talk about this issue but i come from a mixed status family and have had both one of my parents and a sibling be deported and grew up in a neighborhood where ICE was knocking on people's doors when I was growing up and like asking for their papers. And so when someone says, oh, if we give them the right to vote, then why would they become citizens? I think about just like the terror that our people live in for not having legal status. And I, I always think if you don't like, you have to not know that that is the reality that our people are living here. To, to think that voting is the only driver of this, right? If you are somebody who cares that people have to become citizens, I personally do not think that people need to be citizens, that they need to become legal citizens in order to be able to vote, which is why I'm moving this forward. If we are making decisions that impact people in our communities, then they should have a say in those decisions. If people in our communities are going to work every day and they're paying taxes, that we are making decisions in our budget on how to spend in our neighborhoods and in their communities, then they should have a say. They should get to elect their representatives. They should get to say what they want, who they want and where, right? And if you have this core belief in democracy, if you have this inherent belief that democracy is good, that people should have a voice, that our decisions and our government is better when more of us are involved in it, then you should be supportive of this kind of measure, whether or not you think that it will deter people from becoming citizens, right? And so again, different answers for different people. For my people, it was just like, hey, what about people becoming citizens? I'd be like, what about people becoming citizens? <laughs> right, I'm just like, in Boston specifically, we're trying to move um, this, non-citizen voting for people who have legal status already so people either have green cards or they have visas and so they already have some kind of legal standing here um, in the country similarly we're also a sanctuary city and so we're trying to navigate like what does all of that mean if we are a sanctuary city then why are we not enfranchising our immigrants and so i think that my answer to that is always to bring it back to our values what are our shared values as a city? What are our shared values as a city government? What are our shared values as a society? And to really bring home and drive this idea that this is in alignment with our values. This is in alignment with who we say we are, not just as the city of Boston, but this is in alignment with who we say we are as a country. This is in alignment with who we say we are in our constitution. This is in alignment with who we want to be in the world. And therefore we should be supportive and push these kinds of measures. Um, so I'll jump in with there are a bunch of people asking, really, what do we mean when we're talking about non citizens, because I think we've thrown uh, a lot of terminology for people who are not immersed in this and so it's sort of what do you mean when you're talking about non citizen and also how did you sort of make the cutoff decisions that you did I, I know that you talked a little bit about this and that with respect to okay it's just going to be parents. Um, it's just gonna be school board elections and it's undocumented in some places, all these different categories. So maybe each of you can just spend a few seconds explaining that for your city. Sure, um, so in San Francisco, uh, we define our non-citizen voting, as I mentioned earlier, um, includes undocumented folks, and then also the, the spectrum from undocumented to green card holder um, and everything in between, but again, is more limited in terms of where people can vote and what types of elections. And I think the, the way that we came to that was just that, you know, given, I think, um, the, the base of people that are part of our, our community efforts, our community organizing, we, we didn't feel like we could draw that line in the sand. Um, and also given that the election was more limited in scope, it was just school board. Uh, we did feel like that gave us um, the kind of 
we would still um, be able to pass the measure if we included undocumented people because it was just for school board, whereas the political window might not have been there if we you know, expanded to municipal and included undocumented folks. So um, that's a little bit from San Francisco. Yeah, and here in Boston, the we the term we are defining the term immigrants with legal status, and it, it refers to people who are lawful permanent residents, people who are visa holders, people who are here on temporary protected status, and DACA recipients as well. Uh, and according to our numbers here, there's about sixty eight thousand of those people here in the city of Boston. And so, as similar. It, it's pretty much the same um, as what, what's being proposed in Boston, um, what's being done here in New York City. And that, like Annette uh, pointed out, is has everything to do with the political climate and the political window, right? Like in my mind, this is the first step because I would like to see full enfranchisement of every single person here who lives and contributes to our, our city, period, right? Um, but, you know, the, the, the that decision was made um, after you know, long conversations and calculations around what we thought was politically possible um, in this moment while also being like incredibly aspirational and really, uh, you know, ambitious around it. And then understanding that like, this is, this is a continued fight, right? Like we're still talking about a political window because we need to, we need to steward a really successful implementation to then take the next steps because the same people who didn't want it to pass don't want people to show up to the polls either. And that's real too, right? Like when we talk about a lot of the, and I know I'm going on a tangent here a little bit, but when we talk about the, the divisiveness, um, you know, it's, it has a lot to do with just not people thinking that an entire, um, race, culture, um, ethnicity, just like power, vote will be diluted, but diluted, but that a sitting elected that identifies with a particular group will, their voter base in theory will be diluted. And like, you know, folks wanna hold on to their power and their their seat. So it's, it's defined the same way in, in here in New York that will enfranchise somewhere like around a million people, which is pretty, in, pretty incredible and exciting. Um, but like, you know, we have our, our worries around um, the funding of the, the education outreach and all that stuff for, for successful impl implementation so that all the folks that do want to step into the, the, you know, the voting booth can. Alex, I was going to ask you to come back on camera. So you, you read my mind because I just want to bring you back into it for a second and, and ask if there are any parallels from what went on in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century in terms of the movements and the pushback and the push forward on this? Um, yes, there are there are some parallels and, and they're not always cheering. Um, I mean, one, th one thing we have to remember is that, uh, you know, on the one hand, there are these movements to expand the franchise, but in the 19th century, there were also significant anti-immigrant movements, including the Know Nothing movement, which was quite successful in Boston, among other places, um, and in Massachusetts, among other places, which, and in several states, including for a brief time Massachusetts, laws were passed saying that naturalized immigrants had to wait for a number of years after being naturalized in order to be able to vote. So the currents, the currents are powerful and swirling, and I think it's fair to say that uh, that they always have been. Um, I, I was at, there was a question in the chat asking me about the party alignments, uh, or a question in the Q and A um, in these movements, and they were varied and, as a whole, pr pretty opportunistic. I mean, the Democratic Party tended to be pro-immigrant in the North and anti-immigrant in the South. Um, so. Um, there's not a consistency there. If, if I may, um, but I, you know, I, I, one thing I wanted to mention as another model in the past about this is that there was a time when women were allowed to vote only in school board elections, um, when they weren't generally enfranchised. And that was, that was also seen, and rightly so, as a, as a step towards a, towards, a, towards a broader goal. But a question that I have, which I would love to hear an answer to from people who, who who know much more about this than I do, which is, do we, do we know why people who have been here for more than five years have not become citizens? I mean, do we have, do we have data on what the different factors are there? Uh, I'm trying to, th I'm thinking of making counter arguments to those 
who are objecting and saying, just let them become citizens. Um, it's my final comment. Um, we have run out of time and we have a million other questions. <laughs> but so for now, I, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth and to see if there are any last remarks that people really, really wanna give us and, and to wrap it up. Well, first things first, a uh, big thank you to the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School for hosting this important conversation about uh, non-citizen voting, civic engagement, and building a multiracial democracy. Uh, it was so encouraged. It was somewhat encouraging to hear that it took decades uh, in San Francisco and New York City. It feels like. Uh, taking advantage of the right political moment is uh, what people like Councillor Lara and I need to do to win this thing in Boston. Uh, and I think, you know, I feel like Annette said it well, power, not panic. I think this is, uh, I think while a lot of us are a little bit panicked about the midterms or about COVID or literally anything else that's happening, uh, this is a way for us to take power uh, for a multiracial democracy in which every person uh, has a say in the decisions that impact their everyday lives. Uh, so really thank you for uh, all of your work on making non-citizen voting a reality in San Francisco and New York City. We will do the same or we'll try to do the same here in Boston. Uh, and really big thank you uh, to all of you for joining us today uh, for this very important conversation.